Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here again on our uh, second week of a digital online 1100 service. Uh, I'm privileged to be uh, invited into your homes or wherever you may be watching. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. If we haven't met yet, my name is John Holmes. Uh, despite my super long hair, I am in the military and I work here on this base, uh, much like everybody else. Um, I'm filling in for Chaplain Wickham this week. Um, and today we're going to be talking about being fully invested into Christ. But before we get started, let us start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability to be able to gather through technology and all be joined in, uh, in one place uh, to worship you, to worship you in, in any way that, uh, that we're able to. And we thank you for this time and we thank you for the ability to be able to continue to worship you together as a body in Christ. Amen. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about being fully invested in Christ. Now we're going to continue down through uh, Matthew. That's where Chaplain Wickham was left off. Uh, we're going to pick up at Matthew chapter 19, starting with verse 16, going through verse 30. Now this passage may be familiar to many of you. It is the passage of the rich man who wants to know, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus responds, and this is the way that we know the message of, it's easier for a camel to make its way through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to gain access into heaven. So instead of reading the whole passage to you, uh, it's pretty long. I'm just going to give you a quick recap. So there's a man, and when you look at all four of the Gospels, uh, we don't really know who the man is. Some say he was just a random man. Others say he was a rich man. And another says that he was actually like a religious leader of the time. But anyway, whoever that person is, he approaches Christ and asks him, What good thing can I do to gain me access into heaven? Jesus immediately responds back to him, Why are you asking me what's good? There's only one thing that's good, and that's the Father in heaven. And the man just asks him again, well, what can I do to make sure that I have a seat in heaven? Jesus responds back to him, you need to keep the commandments. And then he starts listing them off, which commands he needs to follow. And the man just immediately cuts him off. I got it, I got it, I got it. I've been keeping those commands my entire life. What is the one thing that I'm missing? And Jesus looks at him and responds back with, well, sell all of your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then follow me. So then what does the man do at that point? Does he drop everything? No, he does not. He tucks his tail between his legs and he walks away saddened because he had placed so much faith and so much of who he was into those earthly possessions. Now, that's just pretty much just a quick recap of the story. Uh, it does go along for a couple extra verses and there's some responses that the disciples have that we're going to address as well. Uh, but I really just wanted to get to that point. So. I know what many of you may be thinking, because I would be thinking the very same thing if I were sitting here listening to myself. I would be thinking, well, I'm not rich, so this message does not apply to me. So I can continue on doing what I want to do, like check the trader. But I'm here to say that the perspective on what is rich may be drastically different than what we think in our Western culture. Sure, wealth and financial standing definitely plays into what is rich, but what about your job, just the ability to be able to earn an income? Or what about owning a car? Some places, if you have a car, you are rich. Or how about a loving family, that spouse that loves you and is married to you, or the children that look up to you and that you provide for? Or what about even the breath that's found within your lungs that you're breathing right now? Everything that we have within this life is a blessing. You're not guaranteed any of it. We're not guaranteed the next 20 minutes. God determines when it's time for us to, to clock out and be called back up to heaven. So someone may be looking at your life and consider you rich because of any of the number of things that we just spoke of. So the purpose of what we're going to be talking about today is we need to be fully invested in Christ. So we find that during times of crisis, we start evaluating ourselves and we evaluate what's important to my life. Do I need to spend more time with my family? Do I need to stop smoking? Do I need to invest my money into a different stock? We begin to question about what's truly valuable in this life. And it's pretty apparent because we're meeting digitally and what's going on with the world. And uh, it's pretty easy to understand that we are in a time of crisis right now. So uh, I personally believe that through this time, a lot of people are starting to question what is truly important in this life. But before we get into this and really know how to be fully invested in Christ, we first have to start and get a picture of what it looks like to not be fully invested in Christ. And that's where we're going to begin. We're going to begin with what's called being a diversified portfolio of faith. And we're using like investment words for a reason because the stock market goes up and down. And at the time, right about now, it's starting to work its way back up. So investing is really on the hearts and minds of a lot of people. 
So let's look at the, the man in the passage. He did have faith and he had, had it placed in several different things. The first one that we're going to talk about is that he placed his faith in his own actions. If you look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So he is saying, what is that one good deed that he can do that will get him that guaranteed seat in heaven? Now, many times I'll get phone calls in my office saying, hey, what do I got to do to get that guaranteed seat on the flight out of here? We're just looking to see whatever I can do to get what I want. How often will we do the same thing? How many times have we volunteered to work at a homeless shelter, soup kitchen, or any one of a number of things where we're helping out somebody that we consider to be less fortunate? You know, we're filling up the bowls with the soup, we're taking selfies with the homeless people, all this other crazy stuff that we're doing that we feel like are good deeds that are going to have some kind of benefit for us. Or, big thing in the military, volunteer service medal. We've been keeping them logs, we've been tracking our hours for years and years and years. And then finally, got it. Outstanding military voluntary, voluntary service medal. Maybe that will make me good enough. Maybe that will make me good enough in the eyes of God. But by attempting to place our eternal security in our own physical deeds is removing the need of God within our lives. And if you turn to Ephesians 2.9, we find that salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done so that none of us can boast about it. Salvation is only by the grace of God alone. There is nothing that you can do. The second thing that we find that he placed his, his faith in was the security of his finances. So if we look at, as Jesus was listing the commands that needed to be followed, so he listed off, I think it was about four of them, the guy cut him off and said, yeah, 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 Jesus, I got it. I've kept all of those. What else do I need to do? How does Jesus respond? Which I really like the way he responded because he really responds in like true Jesus fashion. He already knows what's going on in the man's heart. Like he didn't have to start listing out the commands. He could have just said the one thing that was going to cut straight to his heart immediately. But he kind of just let it play out a little bit. So he tells him, sell all of your belongings, give away the money, and come follow me. And again, so what does the man do? He tucks his tail between his legs and he walks away sad because he's a very wealthy man. He knows it. And he's putting his security in those finances, the lifestyle that he's living, that fancy BMW that he's driving. He's putting who he is into those things. So that's all well and great for this guy back in biblical times. But how does this apply to me? Well, I know for me, I for sure do the same thing. I invest my money in stocks, mutual funds, real estate. Um, and frankly, a lot of the companies that I invest in, I have no idea even what they do or if I agree with their products or not. Or maybe I'm thinking I just need to work just a few more years to just boost my retirement, maybe another 2.5%. Or if I do another couple extra years beyond that, maybe I can get an extra 5% on my retirement. Or maybe I just need to be prepared in case something happens. We need to have, like, I think they're recommending anywhere from three to five months of your salary saved up in savings just in case something happens. Does anybody else have the same thoughts as me? Or is it just me? could just be me. But what we tend to forget about, that if Christ comes back right now as I'm talking to you, that retirement fund, that three months pay, that sweet car that you may have, that means absolutely nothing. Don't be diversified. We need to be all in on Jesus Christ. So then how do we do that? And that moves us into our next point. Christ wants us to drop everything and follow him. So Christ instructed the man that he must sell all of his possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, and then follow him. Now, if you'll note, this is not the first time that Jesus has approached somebody and said, drop what you're doing and come follow me. If we look at Matthew 4, 18 through 19, we find Simon and Peter, they're both out fishing. Jesus walks up to him and says, hey, drop your nets, let's go, come follow me. And then what do they do? They drop their nets and they come follow him. If you look in Mark 2.14, we see Levi, the tax collector, and Jesus approaches him and says, hey, stop doing what you're doing and come follow me. Then what does Levi do? He gets up and goes follows Jesus. Now, in my mind, because how I probably would have approached it, I would have flipped the table over and said, I'm out of here and follow Jesus out. But I don't know if that's how it really went down. But what I want to make sure we're understanding is Jesus is not simply asking us to sell everything that we have and then give the money to the poor and follow him. 
What Christ is doing is he is specifically addressing the issues in our own hearts that are preventing us from fully following him. So if we look back to the man in the story, the financial standing of that man was more important to him than Jesus and what Jesus had to offer. So I find that we need to ask ourselves, what is standing in our life? What is in our life that is standing in the way of us being able to follow Jesus Christ? Is it my financial standing? Is it a past hurt that I'm carrying around? Maybe somebody in the church has hurt my feelings and you know, maybe I just don't go to church anymore. I'm just checking out this online thing because I don't have to leave my house. The things that are taking Christ's rightful place in our hearts are these things that you know, we've talked about. What are we placing more of our faith in? Because whatever that is, is on our heart, and that's the rightful seat of Jesus. So Jesus kind of gives us um, an illustration on how to better understand how heavy these burdens are and how heavy these loads are on our, on our spiritual selves. So if you go to Matthew 19, 24, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter heaven. So remember that we first talked about how everybody is rich um, in some way, shape, or form. And even Matthew 19, 25 gives credit to this. So after Jesus talks about the camel and the needle, the disciples were astounded and they asked Jesus, well, then who in the world can be saved? Well, obviously, then this, this concept of richness is applicable to everybody within the world. So when we start breaking down the illustration of the camel, uh, there's really kind of two perspectives we can kind of go with on this. First is Jesus is actually talking about an actual live gigantic camel fitting through an uh, eye of a needle. And if you're not part of some of the sewing clubs, then you know that the, the eye of the needle is a little round part that the thread goes through. And that's about my full understanding of sewing. The second option that Jesus is talking about, and Jesus is actually referring to a small entrance in the wall that surrounds Jerusalem. And that small entrance was kind of used after hours, and it was actually really, really small. Um, and this actually had a name of the Eye of the Needle. Some people think that he's talking about that. Some people think that he's talking about the first option. There's a lot of arguing about your theology's wrong on the, the wall theory. No, your theology's wrong on the needle theory. But what I'm here to say is that doesn't really matter. We're not here to argue which part of the illustration is accurate and not accurate. But we are going to talk about the one with the wall because I feel that illustration fits better into what we're talking about and it's a little bit easier to understand because I think for a camel to actually fit through the eye of a needle is pretty impossible. So to get the camel through the eye of the needle, the hole in the wall, would be extremely difficult. But what we have to understand is it's not impossible for that camel to fit through that small hole. What were camels primarily used for back in the days of Jesus? They were primarily used to transport people and things. They were like the cargo haulers. So when they were loaded down with people and cargo, they were extremely bulky, right? So this gate is very, very small, and there is no way that a loaded camel would ever be able to fit through that small hole. And in fact, it would probably be tedious enough to get an unloaded camel through that tiny hole. But notice the small part of the illustration. The load that's on the camel has to be unloaded by someone. The camel cannot take the packs off of themselves. It has to be done by a person. So looking back at Matthew 19, 25 through 26, the disciples were astounding. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. So the camel needs someone to unload it, just as we need Christ to unload us of our burdens and those things that are preventing us from being able to follow him. The load we are carrying that we think is so, so important, we have to let Christ remove that so that we can follow him through that narrow opening. And it's only through the grace of God that we'll be able to follow him. There's no other way. Now that we're talking about unloading burdens and, and following people, or following Christ, not people, uh, it's important to understand that this is a two-part function. We need to drop everything and we need to follow him. So it is completely possible that we could drop everything and still choose not to follow God. During this time of uh, crisis and panic, uh, asking yourself what's really important in life, what's not important in life, you can still choose to give up different things. Um, and choose not to follow Christ. Um, these are called resolutions. We 
pretty much do them once a year. Everybody has a New Year's resolution that they want to quit smoking, quit drinking, hang out with my kids, whatever the case may be. But just like the camel is unloaded, it still needs, it still needs to follow the master through the gate. So the camel can have everything taken off of it, and it may still not choose to follow the master through the gate. You need to unburden yourself, and you still need to follow Christ through the opening. The dropping of the burdens needs to be out of love and pursuit for Christ, not out of what good we think we're going to gain out of it. So are we willing to drop what is standing in the way of Jesus and follow him? We move on to our last point. We didn't really talk about this part of the story. This is what I was talking about. The disciples uh, had some things to say in response to Jesus' uh, camel and the needle story. So if we turn to Matthew 19.27, we're pretty much going to determine that we need to check our motives. So then Peter said to him, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Christ knows the intentions of the heart before any action has ever even happened. Christ gently answers Peter and responds to him with, Peter, those who first are going to be last, and those who are last are going to be first. So like with Peter, it's easier for us to fall into the routine of doing something for the benefit about what it's going to give me. I find in myself, will volunteer for recognition that's going to go on that evaluation or be able to count towards a medal that I may or may not receive. Or we'll dump a large amount of money into a stock, into a company that, honestly, I could care less about. I only care about the financial gain that I'm going to get by giving them my money. We must ask ourselves, are we dropping everything for a true pursuit of Christ, or are we just looking for the accolades that go along with it? So in conclusion, we talked about today, we discussed about being fully invested in Christ. First, we discussed about not being fully invested in Christ and being diversified in our faith, kind of like a Jesus plus model. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I really need to make sure that I have $600,000 to make sure that I can adequately afford my Beamer uh, after I retire. We also discussed how we achieve that that fully uh, invested life in Christ and how he wants us to drop everything to be able to follow him. And if we're not able to drop everything, we're not going to be able to follow him because we're going to have those, those things that we are putting our faith in are taking his place in our hearts. And thirdly, we discussed that we need to make sure that we are dropping the things in our life for the right reasons, that we're dropping them out of a true love for Christ and not out of, I just want to get in shape or some kind of financial gain, what I'm going to get out of it. So wrapping up, typically I'll wrap up with two closing questions. So for those who have made a decision to follow Christ, we must ask ourselves, is there anything in my life holding me back from being fully invested in Christ? Now for those who are still kind of checking things out, you haven't really made a decision, but you're watching online now, you've been coming to church and you're getting kind of curious, and you haven't quite made that decision to follow Christ, and maybe during these uncertain times, you're finding yourself realizing that in fact there is something missing from your life. Let me just remind you, now is always a good time to take that leap of faith. He is waiting for you with welcoming arms. All you have to do is pray a simple little prayer. And it just goes something like this. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and there is nothing that I can do to save myself. I confess my complete helplessness to forgive my own sins or to work my way to heaven. At this time, I trust in Christ alone as the one who bore my sin and he died on the cross. I believe that he did all that will ever be necessary for me to stand in your holy presence. I thank you that Christ was raised from the dead as a guarantee of my own resurrection. As best as I can, I now transfer my trust to him. I am grateful that he has promised to receive me despite my many sins and failures. Father, I take you at your word. I thank you that I can face death now that you are my Savior. Thank you for the assurance that you will walk with me through the deep valley. Thank you for hearing my prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So I would just like to say that if you were in that second category and you did say that prayer and you're taking that leap of faith, you got to tell somebody. If you want to post something on our 1100 Facebook page, Post something on there so that we can celebrate with you. Or you can reach out to Chaplain Wickham. Let him know. You can reach out to me. I don't have a Facebook, but I work over in Buckley Hall, and I'm pretty easy to find. So 
Just let somebody know so that we can rejoice with you. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today digitally, whether you're watching it at 11.15 or you're watching it at 9 o'clock at night. Thank you for letting us come into your house. Have a nice day.